As we come together, we acknowledge we gather on sacred land that has been cared for and valued by Indigenous peoples since time immemorial. We give thanks for their ongoing stewardship. In a spirit of truth and reconciliation, we honour and respect their connection to the land and we'll do our best to walk alongside. Welcome to Worship Today with Ascension Lutheran Church in beautiful Nelson, BC. Today is July 14th and the eighth Sunday after Pentecost. In today's gospel, we hear the story of martyrdom of John the Baptist at the hands of King Herod, who feared Jesus' power. Our video service today will have hymns, lessons, prayers, special music, and a sermon. Some of us will gather in to worship in our church building. Some of us will worship through this video. Wherever we are, we are to gather in spirit, and we're really glad you're here. Regarded as the first Hebrew book of prophecy, Amos tells of a materialistic kingdom exploiting God's people. A simple farmer bravely reveals this misconduct, as told in Amos. This is what the Lord God showed me. The Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, see, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass by them. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste, and I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Then Amaziah, priest of Bethel, sent to King Jeroboam of Israel, saying, 
Amos has conspired against you in the very center of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile, away from his hand. And Amazai said to Amos, O seer, go flee away to the land of Judah. Earn your bread there and prophesy there, but never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary and it is a temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered Amaziah, I am no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I am a herdsman, a dresser of a sycamore's tree. And the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. Holy Wisdom holy word. Thanks be to God. Thank God for discerning what in life is spiritual and what is material. Spirit, spirituality is about our relationships. We are not alone. 
When we are aware of Christ in our lives, we thank God, as Paul writes in Ephesians. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glories, glorious grace that he freely bestows on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through the blood and the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavishes on us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mysteries of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time, to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ, we have also obtained an inheritance having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we, who were the first to set our hopes on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of our salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit, this is the pledge of our inheritance towards redemption as God's own people to the praise of his glory. May the church hear what the Spirit is saying. Amen. Sisters and brothers, siblings, the Gospel text on this eighth Sunday after Pentecost is the Gospel according to St. Mark, the sixth chapter, verses 14 to 29. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead, and for this reason, these powers are at work in him. But others said, It is Elijah. And others said, It is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, who might behead it, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you even half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, What should I ask for? She replied, The head of John the baptizer. Immediately, 
she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oaths and for the guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought his head on a platter, and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. This is a gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Infinitely gracious and loving God, the hearts of your holy people, gathered from coast to coast to coast, in our much beloved church, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Canada, the hearts of your holy people are filled with joy and thanksgiving at the opportunity of gathering together in our various places of worship to give you thanks and praise to bow before your holy name and to hear your word of truth, your gospel of our salvation. Till our hearts and minds that they might be fertile grounds for that gospel. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Sisters and brothers, siblings in Christ, the text assigned for this Sunday all show us how God reaches out to the lowly and lifts them up to be proclaimers of God's message to others and partakers with God in God's reign of peace and grace. In the book of Amos, at its seventh chapter, verses 7 to 15, the prophet Amos, who does not see himself worthy of being called a prophet, is called by God from behind his flock precisely for the purpose of delivering God's word to the people of Israel. In the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, Paul's letter, verses 3 to 14, we hear about the ways in which we have been made children of God, having been marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit, the unmistakable seal that binds us eternally unto Christ our Lord and our Redeemer. As a result, we are made to be witnesses of the grace of God which has been bestowed upon us. The Gospel text, for its part, of Mark chapter 6, verses 14 to 29, illustrates the power of the proclamation of the Gospel as well as the unfortunate and expected perils that come with proclaiming its prophetic message. To be honest with you, sisters and brothers, siblings, when we read today's gospel, it is very hard at the end to say the gospel of the Lord, and harder still to answer, thanks be to God. It is hard, not because it is not the gospel, but because of the tragic and ungospel way in which the passage ends. Yet, it is the best way to end and frame this pericope. It is the best way to end and frame this text. And it differently would massage and sanitize the depth of the sin of the human heart and frankly rid us of the opportunity to hear the urgency of the call of both 
John the Baptist, and especially the urgency and the nature of the ministry of Jesus. It is, sisters and brothers, siblings, into that sin-filled, corrupt world that Jesus breaks in. It is in the depth of our sin and sinfulness that Jesus relentlessly and urgently comes. It is even as we make our bed in Sheol that God comes to save us, as we hear in Psalm 139. The atrocity we witness in the beheading of John the Baptist in the Gospel of Mark, as atrocious as it may be, points us, unfortunately and tragically, to the fate that awaits Jesus. John the Baptist is precursor to Jesus in ministry from beginning to end, from birth to death. And yet, for our sake, Jesus enters the world of the atrocity that silences and beheads John. That is the looming gospel hovering over the entire passage. We can now joyfully say, even as we lament and grieve, the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The atrocity depicted in the gospel text, which happens in retaliation to John the Baptist's faithful proclamation, serves as a reminder that the task of proclaiming the gospel can lead to and has often led to tragic ends. The story of Archbishop Oscar Romero of El Salvador, where our faithful missionary, the Reverend Brian Rood, has faithfully served for decades, often risking his own life. The story of Archbishop Oscar Romero is a reminder of the dangers of being prophetic in our proclamation of the gospel and of the perils of speaking truth to power. John the Baptist is a humble prophet who sees himself as a precursor to Jesus, the one he has come ahead of to prepare the way for. John the Baptist goes as far as to see himself unworthy to stoop down and untie the thongs of Jesus' sandals. His humility and his reverence and adoration of Jesus is contrasted with his defiance of Herod, who has acted consistently against the interests of the people and of the vulnerable. Using the power of his position, Herod has been ruthless, merciless, and cruel. As proclaimers of the gospel in the 21st century, we often keep quiet, cave in, and retreat in front of leaders abusing their power. We often remain silent in the face of the vulnerable, being marginalized, abused, and their rights and dignity trampled upon. How long did it take for us, the church, to acknowledge the plight of indigenous people? And how many of us still today are not even able or willing to acknowledge their plight at the hands of both the government at all levels and sadly and hopefully repentantly at the hands of the church? How many of us have turned and looked the other way and passed by the vulnerable and the marginalized like the priest and the Levite in the parable of the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10, verses 30 to 37. How many of us have sought to preserve our comfort to the detriment of the poor and the suffering? How often have we striven to preserve our lives instead of responding to the challenging needs of the neighbor? Sisters and brothers, siblings, Comfortable churches make comfortable members who long to remain comfortable. 
Let me say it again. Comfortable churches make comfortable members who long to remain comfortable. Perhaps the greatest gift the church can give us is to make us uncomfortable. Since it is in our discomfort that we are able to meet the marginalized, the downtrodden, the rejected, the vilified, the poor, and all who live in discomfort. The corrupt nature of power which has rendered the church as powerful as political rulers has made the church in many instances and over the centuries oblivious to the suffering and the pain of others. The church in many cases has not walked with the poor, but rather, like Herodias, enjoyed and thrived in the company of the powerful, abandoning the poor and the marginalized in their misery. Instead of joining John the Baptist, Archbishop Romero, Bonhoeffer, and missionaries such as the Reverend Brian Rood in their journey with the marginalized and their proclamation of God's justice and peace for all, we have either walked past injustices and remained silent or contributed sometimes unknowingly and unintentionally to the deepening of the injustices and the pain of the marginalized and the poor. In light of this self-examination, we, the people of God, hear today's gospel with a sense of deep and abiding guilt. How can we be at times like Herodias? Or how can we be like Herodias' daughter, who is also referred to in the NRSV as Herodias, and who participates cluelessly and contributes in significant ways to the unjust and cruel scheme unfolding. How can we be like Herod's peers and the ruling class who have stood by and done nothing? How can we be like other proclaimers who were contemporaries of John the Baptist, including his disciples, who are nowhere to be seen or even heard? Sound familiar? The guilt of such abandonment of the call to proclaim the gospel in challenging times and circumstances and of speaking truth to power is too great to bear and can rather have a paralyzing effect on us. Yet the gospel which sets us free is abundantly clear in this gospel passage. Yes, the scripture passage depicts the atrocities committed against John the Baptist but the point of the gospel is the faithful proclamation of the gospel in the absence of which cruelty, chaos, and confusion reign. St. Mark in his gospel portrays John the Baptist as the ultimate precursor whose tragic death as a result of his proclamation points to the one coming after him who will also face a tragic death, but this time for the redemption of the world. If on the one hand, John's proclamation of repentance for the forgiveness of sins is upsetting and met with retaliation and death, Jesus' proclamation of God's unending grace, on the other hand, will be met with greater resistance, retaliation, and also death. Yet, it is in Christ's death that John's proclamation is ultimately fulfilled. John the Baptist's proclamation is fully achieved in Jesus' death and resurrection. The scene that Mark depicts brilliantly show us the body, the head of John the Baptist, being passed on pseudo-eucharistically from one person to another, from the guard to Herod, to his daughter, to her mother, sealing the guilt of the participants in the sin of the murder 
an ending of John the Baptist's life. It is the supper of death. This antagonistically points to the Holy Supper in the upper chamber where Jesus institutes precisely the Holy Supper and passes on the plate to his disciples who passes who pass it on to one another as they commune in the death in the body and the blood of Jesus in the death and resurrection of Jesus. The transformative power of Jesus' death and resurrection wipes away our guilt and shame and sets us free to proclaim the gospel. That's the good news, sisters and brothers, siblings. And let's do it. Let's proclaim it freely and courageously. Let's not be held back by the comfort we enjoy. Let's strip ourselves of our privilege and walk with the poor and the marginalized. Let's speak truth to power lovingly. Herod's brother, Philip, who could not speak against the injustices he faced from the king, found a voice in John the Baptist's proclamation. Many of the marginalized among us, as we walk with them, we lend our voices to theirs. And together, we proclaim the gospel that sets all free. May the vo voiceless find their voice in our faithful and courageous proclamation. As we do that, may Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless the word in our hearts and in our minds. Amen. One in the communion of saints and in the power of the Holy Spirit, we join our voices in prayer with the words, In your mercy, you are invited to respond. Hear our prayers. You gather your people into the body of Christ. Where your church is wounded, heal it. Where it is right, strengthen it. Where it is divided, reunite it. In your mercy, hear our prayers. From before the foundation of the world, you are God. Revive ecosystems destroyed by human greed. Curb our desire to put wealth ahead of the health of all who call this planet home. In your mercy, hear our prayers. You established equity and make justice within every nation, tribe, and land. Cause laws to be written and customs to be observed that protect the most vulnerable people. In your mercy, hear our prayers. On the cross, your beloved Son endured pain and death. Bring healing to those in need, hope to any in despair, and comfort to the dying. We pray especially for Millie, Fatima, Marcia, Lois, Anne, Pastor Kristen, Dawn, and Jesse. We pray especially for John Dimitri Johnson and Jessica Bella as they celebrated their marriage yesterday. In your mercy, hear our prayers. You sent your Holy Spirit into this community of faith. Be with our sister churches, Hills of Peace Lutheran in Kamloops, and Reverend Jane Gingrich, Daughter of Ascension. Our global mission companions with the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Peru, President Davila, and other partner synods. Texas, Louisiana, Gulf Coast Synod, 
and Bishop Mike Reinhardt, La Crosse Area Synod and Bishop Felix Malpisa. Empower our ministries that serve and build up local communities, especially those tending to our community garden beds. Nurture our partnership with other community organizations, especially the Nelson Street Outreach Team. In your mercy, hear our prayers. All peoples praise you, O God. We give you thanks and praise for the lives of our loved ones who now rest in you. In the fullness of time, gather us with all your saints in light. In your mercy, hear our prayers. Be with us as we live our mission as a community of Christians, empowered by your grace through word and sacrament, to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with you. Holy God, holy and merciful, into your outstretched arms we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray, trusting in the one who is the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The God of peace, creator, redeemer, and Holy Spirit, bless you, comfort you, and show you the path of life, this day and always. Amen. Go in peace. Love your neighbor. Thanks be to God.